title of my piece is um, What is a Desirable Citizen? The Standards for Immigrants in the US Judiciary between 1915 and 1951. And um, since I um, submitted the kind of the abstract, if you like, um, for this paper, I've kind of narrowed that research a little bit more. So it's more around kind of the late 1920s to 1940s now, at least for this kind of paper that I'm putting together, um, which is kind of at the end now, and I've sent it out to a few people to kind of have a read. Um, so it's something I'm intending to kind of get published um, in some sort of peer-reviewed journal in the near future. I think unlike a lot of other people who've kind of presented, um, majority of my focus is not necessarily on humanitarianism or um, you know specific peoples and whatnot regarding as pertaining to that. As as has been noted, it's kind of more around legal theory, political theory, and whatnot. But um, within my research, I came across um, some some stuff that. I thought connected well to this conference and to the uh, general idea of kind of humanitarianism and in specifically immigration in the US in a historical sense. Um, so I'm kind of intersecting between various kind of themes, you know, humanitarianism, immigration, policy, law and, and whatnot. Um, so just getting forwards and just to give kind of a background detail first. Between 1880 and 1920, what you're seeing roughly uh, in this period in, in the US is approximately around 20 million immigrants uh, coming to US shores. And um, this prompts kind of some, some alarm from American political and intellectual circles at the time about um, how can we regulate numbers and um, kind of what can, what can be the kind of set criteria going forward for regulating those numbers. And um, I think this includes in particular a kind of a greater uh, expanded role for the federal government in that regard um, and in particular kind of the introduction of, in, specifically in intellectual circles about what could be what could constitute desirable criteria so um, in specifically in this case I want to talk about two um, officials were experiment, experimenting with kind of a variety of different standards and um, in particular that came to mind when I was kind of going through my research a lot and came up quite frequently uh, and that's still used today is the terms of good moral character or, or actions of moral turpitude if you don't kind of if you commit an act of moral turpitude or if you don't comprise good moral character as set out by kind of US standards then there's a good chance perhaps that you may not get in as a citizen or you, likewise you may be deported if you already reside in the country. Um, the consequence of when these started to kind of come to prominence in the early 20th century was uh, you see um, kind of a courts having to face an unprecedented number of cases in front of them uh, and new statutes in particular so they have, they've got a stronger quantitative um, uh, workload in front in front of them but they've also having to define these immigration standards uh, and many in particular took issue with this idea of these concepts are fairly vague and open-ended in their nature it's really hard to pin down what kind of morality means and kind of who is a person of good moral character and who's not and are there for certain actions that consider it and should that um, define a person uh, in, her, in the whole or should we look at them in kind of fragmented separate parts? So it's a really difficult concept to think of in that regard. Um, and this included, of course, prominent uh, judges at the time who, who found issue with it. Um, and quotes here, the first one in particular, who's the kind of the, the focus of, who's been the focus of a lot of my PhD research and um, kind of the ongoing joke in each conference is, well, have you got someone who's, uh, has your, is your research containing someone who has a better name than perhaps learned hand, especially as a judge as well. And when they're, they're, they're kind of um, role is to write opinions and whatnot, um, it's kind of high standards to live up to. But he said in 1952 to a colleague, uh, when such language as good moral character is adopted as the standard, issue becomes practically impossible to apply. That was in 1952. Um, now I've added a second, uh, a second uh, quote there on purpose, um, which is of course, you know, a good 80 years later um, from Justice Stephen Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. And he dissented from a case um, in 2019 called Milton versus Pree. And in this case, uh, the Supreme Court effectively said that um, immigrants who kind of served uh, who had served criminal sentences could still be detained for deportation without bond hearings. Um, Breyer, found, Breyer was concerned with this, and in his, in his dissent, he warned against kind of the broad interpretation of moral turpitude and specifically the risk this posed for 
um, conflating kind of immigrant serious acts that might be committed by some immigrants, although still a very select few, such as murder or rape, with someone who might be you know, just illegally downloading some music or possessing stolen bus transfers. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's many American citizens who are guilty of pirate, you know, streaming online uh, content and whatnot. And um, so, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a, a moral conundrum there in that sense. Um, and I, I put this in as well because I think, and uh, coming back to kind of what Jairus is about as well, it's not only about talking about your um, your research, but also you know what kind of the, the broader practical significance of your work. And I think um, this challenge is not as difficult. Someone like Lisa, she had a very kind of uh, exciting project to, to to kind of display and showing how kind of the practical consequences of what was a really kind of interesting project um, and to show how the kind of the real world effects that has had. Um, so mine's more. You know, I'm more discussing about how kind of my theoretical discussions um, shouldn't just be a matter, I think, of um, intellectual concern, but one of wider public interest when we think about um, recent presidential rhetoric, the growing infamy, if you like, of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, and the kind of the use of, of character as a proxy for, you know, assessing whether one should be deported or, or, or not. Um, and... Um, the role of the judiciary in this sense has been quite largely understudied in, 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 in literature. I know kind of the, the executive, the presidency and Congress are in general have received more, more, more literature for, for obvious reasons, which I won't go into now. Um, so yeah, my research has kind of looked at way, attempts to kind of define these aforementioned kind of subjective standards of morality. Um, as I've shown this kind of, uh, it, it, this is the current website for US Citizenship and Immigration Services as well. Um, so it's a standard, the standard that was that was that people were held to, but it still continues to be held to today. You know, good moral character in particular is something you know for many people who are applying for visas have to go through. Uh, and, and my paper that I'm going to go forward with now is not necessarily arguing that this standard should be scrapped, but but that the, that there should be kind of a more concerted and more um, in depth discussion and perhaps reassessment of. The viability of these standards and perhaps how are they how can they best be used going forward if at all so um just going forward i want to just set a little bit more background context to my research um in a historical sense and good moral character moral turpitude in the us so um both of these obviously proved to be very problematic context statutory context for judges particularly in the early to mid 20th century um, due to their vague definitions, but also a lack of legislative guidance. Congress uh, uh, has not provided you know, much in the way of kind of um, set, you know, criteria. It's tough to really pin down. Um, and I've given another example of kind of in the mid fifties of uh, another justice, Chief Justice Robert Jackson, who descended from a Supreme Court hearing, a Supreme Court case then uh, regarding this. Um, the ambiguity of, of what is kind of a good character or a good immigrant character um, can be traced back even further. It was uh, it first appeared in the 18th century um, in, as, a, as a prerequisite for citizenship in the, the country's first naturalization statute, the 1790 uh, Naturalization Act. Um, and following the debate, Congress introduced um, the idea that prospective citizens had to uh, provide evidence of good and proper behavior. And of course, however, there was no specific standards really laid out um, for this requirement. So it left it very difficult for applicants to really um, interpret what this could mean. And that's a kind of an issue that's pervaded since. Um, so it's characterized kind of immigration morality standards since effectively the years close to the founding. Um, so without kind of a list of what's deemed kind of morally acceptable uh, standards, judges have had to subsequently lean on their own personal discretion, their own moral compasses, they're seen as moral arbiters, kind of leaders in an ethical sense, if you like. Um, and when immigration came under federal focus in the earlier 20th century, um, there's new factors coming into mind that are being used as, again, as a proxy for preventing people coming into the US. So, for example, adultery, um, homosexuality. Um, these were invoked as charges against would-be citizens and reasons why they shouldn't. You know, this is an opportunity for purists to, and pure, you know, to really seize on, on, on their kind of very subjective determinations of what you know, is a moral character. Um, and I think a good kind of uh, representation or characterization, if you like, of this is the, the Gillingham Commission, um, which uh, was formed in February of 1907, 
And between 1907 and 1911, they conducted the largest ever immigration study in the US. Um, now the commission's methods have been challenged in recent scholarship and I've kind of written down on the, on the side of this slide, if you can see uh, some words from Vincent Perello uh, regarding that. But at the time, um, it, its effect was quite huge. Um, it played an important role in painting this kind of mass influx of immigrants um, to the US as a threat to American culture and standards of living. And um, naturally this kind of prompted a number of different rulings when the issue came before courts as well. So prohibition was a good example of this, the, the, um, the, the banning of kind of manufacturing and, and dissemination of alcohol. Um, just one specific example, there was a court that denied citizenship application for, for a young man um, because it had been found that he'd been using, he'd been consuming alcohol for his personal use only. Um, <clears throat> he possessed it for his personal use, so he wasn't kind of profiting off it, he wasn't defrauding the American government of any tax or anything. Uh, even when the court denied it, it in, the, in its own ruling, it said that such practice was probably accepted even in the best of society. That was its own words. So you're seeing that, it, that courts are publicly posturing, saying there's a bit of an absurdity to this. Um, so this kind of imprecisely defined legislation plagues courts throughout the 20th century. I could obviously go into hundreds of examples which I don't have time for. Um, but it's also, again, circling back, problematic for immigrants as well, because um, there's no consistent or guiding precedent with which they, can, they could follow at the time. That, that's a problem in itself. Um, it's unascertainable in some senses. Um, and it's only kind of through the thoughtfulness and reflectiveness of a very small selection of, of scholars today and kind of certain judges that these issues have generated meaningful discussion. Um, that kind of circles me back again to, to my case study, um, Learned Hands, and um, a man who was who sat on, and he was a district judge and then he, he, uh, he became a, a second circuit appellate judge. And um, so in many senses, he was kind of the last line of defense before, prior to the Supreme Court. Um, he taught the second circuit court of appeals covered the states of New York, Connecticut and Vermont. So particularly in New York City, a massive gateway for immigration at the time, he was hearing a lot of immigration proceedings. Um, he's a man that's often considered the, one of the most, if not the most talented judge not to sit on the Supreme Court in the 20th century. Um, but what kind of stood out for him in the immigration issues, he kind of caught on to these problems quite early on with morality standards. Um, unlike many passive judges, he kind of sought to kind of bring to light these problems that were plaguing him and many others. Um, his arguments in kind of case opinions, extrajudicial speeches, private correspondence, uh, display kind of a, that he can, tries to contextualise immigration and morality standards within kind of broader questions about lawmaking in democracy, but also to show some very evocative uh, and colourful language from him regarding this. Um, and in particular, he introduced what was called the common conscience test. And this is where I'm going to try and simplify some very complex democratic theory into a very basic point. So um, what Howard wanted to do was firstly, um, introducing this test in immigration hearings was to, um, yeah, as I know, put, have three different aims. First, he wanted to reduce the discretionary latitude of the judges. So what I mean by that is simply coming back to this idea that judges shouldn't always rely on their own personal motives. Can they all have their own, all judges have their own kind of prejudices, predispositions about stuff. I think about in this time as well, when the law is even less accessible than it is now, this, you know, uh, is a, a um, an occupation filled at the judicial, at the judgeship level, obviously by pretty much only men. Uh, white men and mostly of an upper to middle class, upper middle class to upper class um, kind of background. Um, second, uh, he wanted to incorporate kind of a broader set of American voices in the formulation of immigration restrictions. And then thirdly, he wanted those first two um, factors to kind of lead to kind of a, a, an ultimate outcome where there's an empowerment of democratic theory and sort of, uh, uh, sorry, empowerment of democratic thinking um, on issues of kind of that have great social, cultural, and humanitarian implications for people. So, um, if people, if, if we have to kind of ask people, not necessarily a, kind of a direct democracy referendum type, but if we to, if we want to kind of um, strengthen the voices of, of American society and ask them for their own. Um, position on kind of moral standards, then perhaps it gets them to think more critically about the decisions that are made. Um, and even if they're not the ones making those decisions as lawmakers, they can at least think about how's my, uh, my, my ideas, my conception of morality, the treatment of immigrants, um, and my views on that going to be uh, represented when I go to the ballot box. They'll think more critically about that. So um, how are we doing for time? Check, okay, all good. Uh, so yeah, so 
thinking about this and how was it used in practice? So Pan begins to apply this test frequently in the 1940s. Now he introduced it in the 1920s, but I, I want to kind of focus specifically in the 1940s for two specific decisions. Um, and what made it particularly interesting was that um, he did so in cases that were believed to be very borderline for which way the decision would swing for the immigrant. Um, they both involved naturalization applications. Um, and he, he thought carefully about kind of the potential consequences these could have as well um, for the immigrants. I think one thing that's kind of when you think about a topical connection here with, with what you see often spoke about in the American news media today is the idea of separating parents and families. And that's what you see in both of these in particular. Now, um, Hand used his public position again to posture to Congress and the American citizenry. Um, and the goal was to prompt the discussion about this. So the first case that I want to talk about quickly was US versus Franciosco. They're both in 1947, these cases. So this case involved an Italian called Frank Francioso. Um, so he applies for citizenship uh, to the US. He successfully applies to citizenship. Now the government appeals this because Francioso is involved in a incestuous marriage with his niece. Um, Francioso had been living with his niece um, in the state of New York for his five year residency period. So, you know, when you apply for citizenship, you have to have a kind of a five year residency period by and show that you are an upstanding moral citizen and whatnot. Um, and the, uh, the couple as well had four children and the marriage was solemnized by a Catholic priest. Um, now, in considering how Hand and the Second Circuit would decide, Hand memo private memo to his colleagues which are usually the best documents you come across because this is where he can say what he wants about any sort of kind of public consequence and, and let him and let people know what he feels um kind of uh, as, as emotionally as possible um yeah so he writes to his colleagues that um that, that he talked about the court he's trying to identify what is a common conscience in society um and revealed his dissatisfaction more broadly with morality-based standards so he noted, for example, that incest was outlawed in New York State, the year of the marriage, um, which was 1925, so it was already outlawed by then, um, but the standard did not apply nationally, so already we're getting into murky territory, like what's considered kind of a, a, a fair, an average moral standard, if you like, in society. Um, he'd also been married to his wife for 13 years uh, by the time of his five-year examination period, which was between 1938 and 1943, um, so that raised important questions too, most notably, um, you know, it seems to be a man who's lived what one would call a moral life. Um, he's not committing crimes or whatnot. Um, but you know, he questioned if incest should be factored into the equation at all, and if so, to what degree. Um, so this prompted a very passionate response. Um, so in, in private, as I noted. And he hands looked at the prospect here of faulting Franciosco to leave his family on kind of very shaky legal foundation um, and see so it's kind of an even larger act of moral delinquency than allowing him to continue um, his marriage, which is obviously what kind of these moral Puritans wanted to happen. Um, so this is what the quote, the only course continent with the faintest tinge of regard for the most rudimentary decencies was to stay with them and support them, perhaps even so low a form of animal life as an examiner in the naturalization bureau would go as far as that. So I think you can tell um, quite vividly here what he thinks about naturalization examiners, about immigration um, examiners. And um, as you can see, kind of he, he writes in almost poetic sense as well. There was a kind of a bit of a um, a, 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 a showy nature to, to his writing often, but this was in private as well. So um, he, show, he was exhibiting clear frustration. Um, and this translated into these sort of public judicial opinions as well, where he'd explain the rulings of the court. So um, he explained in that opinion that Francesco had been stuck in a moral dilemma here. So on the one hand, leave the country uh, and you can stay in your marriage. Or on the other hand, um, stay in the US, but you have to break away from your family. And thus, what he could quote is saying, depriving these children of the protection, guidance, and solace of a father. Um, he stuck to principle, obviously, and said, right, well, we still need to base the decision on the common conscience test. Um, however, why he continued to believe that his test was better than relying solely on judges' own personal dispositions again? Uh, there was some hypocrisy because he started to infuse some of his own personal standards into the application of the test. Um, and this was evident in his response to this family dilemma. Uh, so, um, he explained again in the opinion, now this is in, in public, that it took until 1893 for New York to invalidate incestuous marriages. And he stated, 
quote, the fact that disapproval of such marriages was so long in taking the form of law shows that it is condemned in no such sense as marriage is forbidden by God's law. Um, so he's kind of playing the, uh, the kind of moral Puritans at their own test there and handed someone who came from a very strong religious background as a child and became fairly agnostic um, as an adult. Um, and so he didn't really feel that weight of kind of uh, spiritual burden, if you like, for, for playing around with religious undertones and, and using them to manipulate them against the very people who he detested were he saw as mistreating immigrants. Um, so in considering this in the context of the test, he added that the consciences of the ordinary man were not aligned with allowing for such a moral sacrifice to be made. In other words, Francioso can stay in the country and he can stay in his marriage and he will be a citizen. Um, the thing is, there was actually no real kind of scientific basis behind his decision, uh, but he argued, uh, but he gauged from his sense of society that one moral decision clearly outweighed the other, and he suspected that if polling a majority of people, they'd agree with him in that sense. Um, they also revealed also that kind of claim that even when claiming to raw moral standards of society, um, there's, it's almost impossible for judges to completely detach themselves from some sort of, sort of personal responsibility. Um, okay, so quickly shifting then to, to the second case, so I don't want to go on for too long. Um, the other 1947 case, 1947 case uh, Rapuay versus the US, um, presented with, I think, even starker difficulties um, with identifying what's a clear common conscious standard. Um, and it involved, in particular, very tragic circumstances because it involved a father's decision to euthanize his severely um, disabled son. So this is just a kind of a, a newspaper, newspaper clipping that I have here from the Akron Beacon Journal on uh, October 1939. This is in the trial period of the case. <clears throat> I'll give you some background details. So um, first things first, Rapuri's acts were seen as fairly merciful in the broader circumstance of the case. And um, nonetheless, Hand and the Second Circuit in this one actually voted with the, to deny the naturalisation application. I'll explain why in a second. So yeah, the facts of the case revolved around um, Louis Rapuay um, his, and his choice to kill his son uh, with chloroform. Now his son had suffered from brain, brain damage since birth um, and left him blind, mute and deformed, um, according to the, the judicial opinion, uh, dependent on feeding and no control of his bladder or bowels. Um, Rapuay decides to do this when the mother's out, the rest of the children are out shopping together. And as you can, if you're reading the newspaper, you can see that the mother was clearly, um, you know, very, very angry about this. Um, and uh, in the heat of the moment, wanted uh, her husband to be punished. Um, nonetheless, throughout the legal process, what we see is a wide belief amongst parties that Rapuri's actions should be viewed with some sympathy. Um, so during each trial, the jury downgrades um, Rapuri's first degree manslaughter charge, or indictment, sorry, to a verdict of second degree manslaughter, and then recommends to give him the utmost clemency. And what you see is the trial judge obliged to that. Um, he says, right, we'll impose a five year sentence, but we'll suspend it and we'll place Rapuri on probation. Um, now, the one issue, of course, again, is coming back to applying for citizenship. Rapuri applied for citizenship, but he didn't get in on a procedural technicality in the end. So he filed for naturalization on 22nd of September, 1944. He killed his son on the 12th of October, 1939. And remember what I was saying about the five year residency period as well. Um, so his actions within that five year residency period and the, the court, the second day court had to assess those actions within that period. Um, so they said in the, in the opinion, despite presenting himself as a dutiful and responsible parent, um, they begrudgingly had to say that he didn't fit the standard of good moral character because he had permitted manslaughter. Um, so Hand again writes the opinion uh, for the court and he highlights three issues again surrounding this idea of the vagueness of morality in immigration law. Um, first, he explains that it's very difficult to identify an objective measuring mechanism when judges didn't, have, didn't always have access to some national inquisition like a Gallup poll. And even when they do, it's still you know, the margins of error, there's issues with that. Uh, the idea of immigration in general is a very fluctuating, uh, very flu it fluctuates a lot on kind of American consciousness um, and it's a very complex topic. Uh, number two, without kind of verifiable measuring standards, uh, the evidence I think would be weak and based on conflicting and unscientific bases. Um, so whilst the jury verdict had ex exhibited compassion for Rapuay, state laws, such as those in Massachusetts have prompted a recent similar offender um, 
to be sent to prison for life. So you're seeing kind of con conflicting uh, rulings here, um, which is completely unfair. And it circles back against this idea that because there is no def real defined definition, if you like, of morality, it's just too hard to pin down. Um, so yeah, they, they concluded to the court that we are reasonably secure in holding that only a majority of virtuous persons would deem the practice of euthanasia uh, morally justifiable. And third and finally, uh, Rapuri, I think, is a good uh, representation of where Han's sympathetic and, if you like, libertarian or civil libertarian stance um, on immigration is demonstrated in his opinion again, and where he's able to insert it in without it being the primary determinant in his decision making. Um, so it was clear he was deeply troubled by Rapuri's case. He described it as a tragic case in, in private to friends um, and was obviously worried that, you know, Rapuri committed this act literally within less than a month outside of the it were inside the residency period. If he'd done it literally a month before, it wouldn't even be assessed in there. He would have become, you know, a newly naturalised American citizen. Um, and to place these sentiments in his opinion, Hand had to actually work with his cousin, who was also on the court at the time, Augustus, to help guide Rapuri out of his difficult legal conundrum. Because um, Augustus, who also had sympathies for, for Rapuri, said that there's an effective solution here, which is effectively just tell him that apply again and everything will be okay. You know, you'll, you'll get there eventually. Um, the crime won't be considered going forward. That's just how the American law works. And so he, he takes his advice and, and places it in his opinion in, what, I guess, what you call dicta. So where um, judges insert parts into their opinion where it doesn't necessarily um, contribute to the overall ruling, but judges feel necessary to add that in there as kind of, you know, using again their public position to provide some education some guidance and whatnot and this is seen frequently through hands opinions for wow he's, he's always trying to find ways that even if he has to rule against the immigrant what can he do to help them um so he'd say he said in there this uh, to repair that this is clearly a pitiable event um but nothing should stop you from prevent you quote from taking your place among us as a citizen um and he provided clear instructions about how you can do that um, and again, it signified how Hand was again willing to utilise that position, as I noted, to translate clear humanitarianism into immigration cases and try and find remedies to prevent people, uh, you know, parents being separated from their families and whatnot, from not being able to get their citizenship. So um, I just want to close out here and briefly conclude. Um, so the policies of good moral character and moral turpitude, I think, have especially sim symbolised immigration laws, very vague contours at times throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. There's a lot of um, studies of race, rightfully so, but what's been used actually throughout history frequently, and, and that's just a, a bad scholarship in that I haven't used examples, but they didn't necessarily come before hand much, but I saw many cases where um, politicians and even judges often uh, use the idea of morality to as a kind of um, veil to hide certain racial prejudices uh, and keep citizens out of the country or deport citizens. Um, but responding with his common conscience test, Hand, I think, raised pressing discussions of kind of wide democratic, intellectual and social importance in that regard. Um, as I know, there's many more examples I could go for, which I don't. I just wanted to note two points. So first, obviously, then these are kind of the arguments I'm trying to bring forward a little bit in my, my paper that I'm writing for a journal article. Um, Hand was stuck with a decision to make when it came to issues of moral grayness um, before him, you could, by seeking America's pulse, um, he believed he found a better democratic tool for assessing moral standards, even though there were a lot of teething issues involved. Um, and it also challenged this widely accepted convention each time that judges represent the best and most trusted source of moral arbitration. Um, just put down a brief kind of quote again here. So, uh, one of these colleagues, um, Hans colleagues, suggested about having kind of an almost an ethical elite who we should call, which should turn to every time we have to have a decision about morality um, made and um, again he's very evocative in, in kind of mocking, mocking that proposition um, and second hand I think raised important discussions and questions about the fairness and viability of morality standards there's just not a huge amount of literature and I see that there's, trying, there's a few scholars are trying to bring this to the mainstream now particularly in history and social science but it's still so few um, <clears throat> Han never explicitly called for the abolition of morality um, standards, but he attempted to invite, I think, a more thoughtful discussion about that placement in American immigration policy in the 20th century. 
and I think his intent was not just to refocus minds on the or, or to focus minds on the rules. Uh, sorry, it was, was to refocus minds on the rules dictating the circumstances of judges, um, rather than perhaps the actions they exhibited in their interpretation. Um, so yeah, just to close out. Um, I think he's brought some discussions into the mainstream during this time on the bench, I think which remain significant policy topics in current American discourse, and something you see constantly in kind of media without it being clearly defined, but it always roots back to the law, which is um, this idea of desirable moral immigrants, um, right and wrong actions uh, from immigrants and behaviours, and deeper consideration over the consequences of actually rejecting naturalisations or affirming or expediting deportations and such standards. Um, it's something that's important to the judiciary as it is to the media, to the wider public. Um, and I think this case study can help propel further assessment of morality's historical legacy, um, but also the potential role this has in kind of the future trajectory of the country's immigration identity going forward and how it wants to assess morality standards. Um, so yeah, I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, I don't want to filibuster too much longer. And, and um, yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.